In today's video, we're going to talk about the wind-up. So if you're a pitcher or you're a coach and you need to teach the young pitchers in your life how to do the wind-up properly, we're going to talk about the different body parts, the arms, the leg kick, the steps, the weight shift, all these different factors and, and aspects of the wind-up. And we'll talk about some of the do's and don'ts for each. So stick around. We're going to talk about the wind-up. So feel free to scrub ahead in this video. You'll see timestamps to each different sort of body part. But let me first just show you the way I teach the wind up, the simplest, easiest way if you don't wanna worry about sort of fine tuning it. So start with feet shoulder width apart, hands about at your chest. You're gonna take a slight rocker step forward at an angle, about 45 degrees, you can see my toe points in. That allows my hips to turn into place a little easier. Then my right foot's gonna turn along the inside of the rubber. I'm gonna lift my leg up and I'm gonna go. Typically my hands are gonna rise up similar at a similar pace with my arm, but in general, we'll do that again at sort of full speed. So step, step, lift, and throw. And I'll do one more and I'll throw this one. All right, so first let's talk about the arms. So in the past, you saw pitchers go over the head and I mean, like way back in the day, you saw arms swinging, you saw, well, how'd they do it? Swing, swing, come together. Lots of weird stuff that pretty much everyone figured out was superfluous and unnecessary. Like if you look at, uh, you know, like Sandy Koufax or any of these guys with like really big over the head arm swinging deliveries, it's just unnecessary movement. So one of the big things to think about with arms is I would recommend against this, what it ends up being is a timing mechanism if you like that as a pitcher, like Max Scherzer does it, it's it's not that complicated as far as it's it's still the same body positioning. You were just going overhead and back down. So we're just arms moving and getting them into the same spot. It's almost just like a hitter. Some hitters like a big leg kick. Some hitters like to move their hands around a lot. This is essentially the same thing. It's just timing. It's extra movement, so you don't need it. So I don't recommend teaching the arm overhead, but if your son wants to tinker with it or your daughter wants to tinker with it, if she's learning to pitch, it's totally fine. But again, it's not something that I would choose to teach. Number two, where should you hold the hands? Some pitchers hold them at their waist. Others have them at their chest. Some have them at their eyes. The easiest thing to do is to have your hands at your chest. And the reason is once we get to our leg kick, the hands are gonna kind of have to be here. When I lift my leg, it's not gonna make a lot of sense to have my hands here. Um, it's kind of an awkward position and I'm not going to have my hands here in most positions. In most cases, it also feels kind of awkward and my arm's a little bit too high. Our handbrake is always going to initiate from our, basically the center of our body, whether you're an outfielder, or an infielder, or catcher, like you receive the ball, it kind of goes through your center and then you start to make the throw. As a pitcher, it's the same thing. So if you start low, typically those pitchers will raise their hands up. Again, it's a timing mechanism. If they start high, they're typically coming down low just the same. So if you want to eliminate some of that movement, it just makes sense to start in the center. And now my hands don't really have to move. They can still bob up and down a little bit with my leg. That's typical because that, it just kind of, your body likes this rhythm to move your legs in concert with your arms. But again, I think the simplest place to hold your arms and to teach a young pitcher to do this is just to have them around their chest. Next part of the pitching windup, let's talk about your step. Basically, basically you have three options. You could step back and then do your rocker step you could step directly to the side. You could step slightly forward at an angle. I teach forward at an angle. It's the easiest way to do it. Uh, it gets your hips starting to turn a little bit, which makes the rocker step feel more comfortable and just is easier. It also doesn't move the center of mass very much. You can see like my weight's not shifting when I do this. If I take a big step here, you can see my center of mass has moved. Same thing back here. And of course the, the mound is gonna start sloping when I step you know, too far back. So. I say in general, avoid stepping back or a big step to the side. I just prefer to teach pitchers just to take this little angled step, which is what you see most MLB pitchers do. Again, most MLB pitchers do the exact same windup that I'm teaching, which is about shoulder width. They take a little angled step, their weight doesn't really shift, they step, they lift, and they pitch. Any other variations are a little extra movement that you don't really need. Back in the day, pitchers tended to use more forward momentum where they're actively sort of stepping through as they do their leg kick. Pitchers now, you never really have a pause. Like you don't, you don't stop here. Once you're lifting your leg, you are moving through it at that point, but you don't need such extreme 
movement, like you saw with someone like Tim Lincecum. That works for some pitchers, but there's also a reason that most don't do it that way. Most big league pitchers who throw harder than they ever have in the game, they have a pretty simplified motion. So that's something to consider. So when you take your step, I think the forward angle step is the easiest, but you can also experiment with what's right for you between the back step and the directly side step. All right, next, let's talk about hand movement. And I briefly touched on this. I just want to briefly hit it again. When you go through your windup, even if you have your hands at your chest, they're typically going to move slightly with your leg, almost as if they're tied together with a string that's normal and it's a good timing mechanism so you shouldn't want your kid if you're teaching a young pitcher to have their hands dead straight and then lift their leg to it and come back down the body works as a system and these little timing mechanisms they help you keep in a rhythm they help you stay together they help sort of body your body sort of sequence together because one part is going to start to accelerate then the next part then the next part then the next part and so these little movements are often timing mechanisms. So my hands rise up a little bit and then they go down. Most pitchers, if you look at them, they have some similar hand movement in concert with their legs. So I think that's a good thing. All right, let's discuss pauses in the pitching windup. So you'll see this, especially with uh, pitchers of Asian descent, you know, Japanese pitchers, uh, Taiwanese pitchers, Korean pitchers, they tend to have pauses more often in their delivery. I'm not sure why they teach that. That seems to have been a historic teach, uh, but there's no real advantage to doing that. And as I mentioned before, once we get to the leg kick, the hips start to subtly move towards the plate while the leg kick is coming up. I'm starting to go forward with my hip. And then certainly when my leg is coming down, I'm already starting to move towards the plate. So the balance position, quote unquote, this position isn't really balancing. You're, you're moving your weight forward at that time. I'm moving through my balance position, not balancing as at a pause or at a stop. So make sure you have that distinction clear. So there is no real reason to integrate a pause. And if you're, uh, you're teaching a young player and they want to throw hitters off and like stop and do different things like you see Nestor Cortez do in the major leagues, that's great for backyard baseball. The more kids are screwing around, imitating their favorite major leaguers, throwing from different arm slots, you know, pausing, doing things to try to throw their buddies off, that stuff's awesome for building body control. If they can throw strikes doing all these weird things in practice, they're gonna be way better throwing strikes in a real game. But I don't recommend making that part of their, their, their actual strategy in a game. So just so we're clear on that, uh, the, the pausing is something that has been taught in some countries. It's never really been taught in the U.S., but it, sent, it sometimes can be a misnomer, so make sure you understand that you're always moving through the balance position, quote-unquote, which is where your leg kick reaches its apex. The next thing to cover is the actual height of your leg kick. Your leg should get to... My balance is terrible today. Let me just address, address that. Um, your leg kick should get to what I call cereal bowl height. So if you could balance a bowl of cereal here and eat out of it, that's like the minimum. If you get really high, you're going to start to stress the limits of your hip flexibility. I had a pretty high leg kick as a pitcher. It may or may not give you any advantage. Nolan Ryan famously said that if he felt he could, if he could lift his leg higher, he could have thrown harder. He already threw like 108 in his prime before radar guns could pick up the ball out of your hand at release speed. So could no one have thrown 112? Maybe. But he claimed that if he could get his leg higher, he could throw harder. That's one man's opinion, not a scientific fact. But... If you're doing the windup, it doesn't make sense. It also doesn't feel good to be below 90 degrees parallel with the ground cereal bowl height. So if your kid's only getting to here, encourage them to get a little higher. And what that does, the higher when you get to Lisa's height, it's easier to lead with your hip to the mound, which is an important part of pitching mechanics that I don't, I don't want to get into today. But getting here, it's a little harder to sort of get this tilt that we want as a pitcher it gets a lot easier when we get to that 90 degree knee parallel with the ground. So make sure when you're coaching a kid, it should be comfortable. They should get to at least here. If they can get a little higher, that's totally fine. It's not probably gonna have any advantage for them. But if you see this really big leg kick or if their foot is kicking out, that's just gonna make it harder for them to throw strikes. It's gonna be more arms and legs flying around where they have to then channel that energy consistently back towards the plate and that's going to make it more challenging to throw strikes so leg kicks should be simple 90 degrees or a little higher 
Legs should be dangling beneath the knee. It shouldn't be kicking out or underneath the butt. It should just sort of fall and then you're gonna go. All right, the last aspect of the wind up that I wanna discuss is wrapping. So wrapping is when I wrap my body around sort of like a center axis. So pitching is a sideways delivery. I'm going sideways down the mound. And then when I land, I'm rotating that 90 degrees to deliver the baseball. Some pitchers, I did this, uh, wrap to a degree. Whereas they lift their leg, they're coming back. So it looks like this, where you'll start to see some of my, maybe one of my jersey numbers. And then I uncoil and I land back in parallel with the mound. So the thing with wrapping is it can often just be a personal preference. I really needed to wrap to feel normal. Some pitchers wrap a tremendous amount. Some pitchers wrap kind of just for show where they rotate and turn back. But like my wrapping personally was part of my delivery where it was a slow winding and a slow and equal unwinding. Some pitchers don't do this. Some pitchers are very much just chest is facing third base and then chest faces the plate later. So there's square there, but my chest as I pitched was facing more towards shortstop. It can be a little more deceptive. It can help you hide the ball. It's not something I would coach. I wouldn't tell a pitcher to wrap more. I would tell pitchers and I have told many pitchers to wrap less because often what happens is when you wrap, it becomes tougher to land in a straight line and it get, becomes tougher to get your arm into the proper position, which I won't go into here, to be ready and on time and on top of the baseball when it's time to deliver it. Because if, if I have to uncoil from back here, it makes it more likely that I land really closed and it makes it more likely that my arm is facing down when I land, which means I'm lagging and then everything is gonna suffer. I'm probably gonna have more stress in my arm. My fastball is gonna be slower. Command's gonna be more tough. I'm not gonna get to the top of my breaking ball very well. So wrapping should be discouraged, a little amount of it, somewhere between Again, my balance is awful today. Uh, somewhere between no wrapping and a little wrapping is fine. But if you see like both numbers, that's probably gonna cause a lot more issues uh, than it's gonna solve. So keep a lookout for wrapping. A little bit is okay. A lot is typically not okay. It's an, often a personal preference and the way that pitcher produces power. As a final note here, I think it's worth discussing that more and more parents are asking, does my kid need to learn the windup? Why can't they just pitch from the stretch, which is an even simpler version? I think this is a fair question to ask. Most pitchers that I know from my, from my generation, including myself, we were more comfortable in the windup. That was how we initially learned. That's kind of how we practiced more often. And I think a lot of times this comes down to just resilience and practice habits. Maybe they only practice at their baseball practices, then it kind of makes sense that maybe they're just not that good at throwing strikes. And a little bit of added body movement in the windup makes it even harder than compared to the stretch. And really, I think that's a practice problem. And I think that's a resilience problem. And I would ask you as a parent uh, of a young pitcher, if your son can only be successful doing it the absolute simplest, most stripped down bare bones way, aka like from, you know, just a leg kick from the stretch, do you really expect them to be a high level pitcher? There's a lot of resilience that's required to be a good pitcher. You're going to pitch in the rain. You're going to pitch in very cold conditions, very windy on flat mounds, on very high mounds with huge holes at the rubber, huge holes uh, at your landing. Those take resilience. You have to learn to throw strikes with your foot landing in a place that you're not used to. So I think you should be cautious about taking all the simplicity uh, or taking all the complexity out. And the windup is not a complex uh, system in general. We're talking about two little rocker steps, turning your body 90 degrees and then roaring down the mound. It's not a complex movement. So I think that's something to just to consider as you're instructing your kid and asking them to, you know, practice different variations of their pitching mechanics. So hopefully this discussion helped. I appreciate you watching. Be sure to subscribe below and I'll see you here in, the, in my next video.